I think we left off this morning with a giant whistle. I won't do that again, so nobody hold their ears. The Lord himself, <laughs> thank you, Lonnie. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and, dead in, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I like this word until. You know, I think I put it in the program until the ultimate end. And so the word until occurs over 139 times, I think, doing my Bible works again. It just, it's always there. Uh, you know, in the communion service, since we're short on time, we won't turn there, but, you know, he took this bread and he took this cup and he said, what did he say again? I will not drink it new with you until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So there was a great anticipation of the second coming there until, you know. I know we've all anticipated things like, you know, what are you going to get on, you know, December 25th morning or whatever. So we we're anticipating a Christmas story. You're going to get a BB gun, a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock. But you'll shoot your eye out. So don't worry about it. Um, so we all anticipated that. Or if you get a rabbit suit uh, from Aunt, what was the aunt's name? Uh, oh, what a junky suit. You know, that's too much like a kid. But we all anticipate, if you do have your Bibles, turn over to, to Matthew 25. And this, this kind of initiates the coming of Jesus. And, and, it, and this is, these are Jesus' own words, aren't they? When the Son of Man comes in His glory. He's going to gather everybody around. So what is he going to do? Um, let me get there and we'll talk about that just for a second. Matthew 25. You know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was sick, you took me in and so on and so forth. Uh, but basically starting um, around verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered together. And then verse 34 is that beautiful phraseology. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, those who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And in, in, in my translation it says, but when the Son of Man. It's not a matter of if, but when. And so we're just waiting until. Amen? Amen. And another great and until, back in the Old Testament, is Psalm 110.1, which Sir Anthony has furiously been working on. That second Adonai occurs 195 times. Adonai, how did you, how, was it 29 times? Lebanese, 24 times. 24 times. And so this is not the Lord God. This is the servant of the Lord God. So, but if you read that again, and I challenge anyone, it shouldn't be a matter of arguing about, you know, Adonai, Adonai, because the first word is the Lord God Almighty. Look at that. It's capitalized. You look in the front of your translation. This is the Lord God, Yahweh. You know, the existing one, the one who is and was and is to come in, in the Greek preference to the Re Re book of Revelation. But Yahweh, the Lord God, says to my Lord, what does He say? Sit at my right hand until, until I make your enemies a footstool. So we're all just waiting for that time of Psalm 2. Ask of me and I will give you the nations. So we're looking for that time when Jesus comes back. It's that glorious, blessed hope, the parousia. Uh, in Revelation, we're not even going to... We're, we're jumping pretty fast towards Revelation 21, 22, but I want to get you there in a nice, order, decently and orderly manner. Go to Revelation eleven fifteen. You know, the book of Revelation has... Kathy could prep, tell you how many verses and how many words and how many sevens in it. And Wally is dot to dot. I think you had like 30, 30 sevens in the book of Revelation in that thing. That was kind of interesting. But to me, 
verse 15, chapter 11, is the center line of the book, kind of. You know, the center line means you got 22 chapters, chapter 11, somewhere in the middle of chapter 11. That would be the center line, approximately. Moses, approximately. We're talking approximately here. And so, when I was working down in Louisiana, where Brother Charles and I used to work, in Pumpkin Center, to get a good job, you have to drive over to the Mississippi. Amen? You know, the oil plants were over there. We had Shell Oil, Nalco, Te Texaco, Exxon, all these oil plants are over there. So if you want a good job, you drove over to the Mississippi, Dan. You went on over there, Glenn. Just like Glenn used to drive that truck all the way into Chicago and run around all the place. The good jobs weren't in Oregon, Illinois. You had to get on out of there. So we drive over the Mississippi. And so I worked in the Shell oil plant, the Texaco oil plant, Nalco Chemical. And Charles was a, a guru in, what was it, Shell? DuPont, 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 yeah. Uh, and I was an engineer over there. I, I started off as a surveyor, and they made me party chief, and that's where you walk around and set all these things. But a critical thought is center line. I'm going to tell you how critical it is. You got a whatever, 30,000-gallon uh, oil tank over here, and a 30,000-gallon oil tank over here, and they had the big tanks all over the place. It was just beautiful to watch those sheet metal guys, you know, big slabs of, you know, iron and the welders come in and weld it up. And so in the middle of all those pumps, you had to have a, those, those big giant tanks. You had to have a pump that would pump it here or pump it there and pump, pump it. So you have, may have four tanks and in the middle you have a pumping station. And surveying our job was to put the pump pad in the middle of all this multi-million dollar storage of oil. And so you had these pipes coming over here and these pipes coming from here and that one going to this and then that one going to that. And you set that pump pad and you better have it right. That center line better be lined up. Those lines better crisscross at the right place because if you got it an inch off, they had to modify about 40 pipes going into this little pump station. And we, we I'm telling you, center line is critical. <laughs> I won't tell you about the one time I messed up. I'll just skip that. <laughs> but you had to have it right. If you didn't do it right, you got a jackhammer and took that sucker, that pad out, and you poured it again. Now, I never had to do that. It was something else I messed up on. I was driving a bulldozer. I hit one of the pilings right at, on the Mississippi River on the other side of the levee. Oh, man, they were mad at me. I, was, I guess I was daydreaming. I had that blade up in the air and it clunk. What do you have to do when you mess a piling up? They had to call in four welders to cut it off, to re-weld it. But anyway, that's another story. My dad was a heap of, my dad was one of the bosses on the job. He was mad. But these, these center line things and getting things exactly right were important because that laid out the, you know, the whole plant itself and the pumping stations and all those things, they were critical. And I'm telling you, this is the most critical center line in the world, Revelation 11.15. Can you buy that? Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. It doesn't get any better than that, Brother Tom. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of of our God and His Christ. And we know who that is. This starts the ultimate end. You had seven churches, seven seals, seven, 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 seven. But the seventh trumpet, that's the whistle one, by the way. Most people associate the seventh trumpet with the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. You know, the shout and the voice and the trumpet of God. So this is it, folks. This really initiates the ultimate end. Jesus is coming back. Jump on over to Revelation 19. This is good stuff. 
the, to, to know what's the center of our salvation, to know the important points of what we're looking at in the future, to know those things that are going to happen are, are, are very critical. Yes, we may modify on different interpretations of, of this one and that and then the other, but you, you should not miss this. Here's the fourth hallelujah down in verse 6. By the way, my Bible has the fourfold hallelujah. Verse 1, after these things I heard something like a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. Now look, jump down to verse 6 and, and let's read the fourth hallelujah, the last one. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Sister Leona, this is it, folks. Jesus is here. And we know the rest of the story. You flip the page on, on Revelation 20. You know. Oh, wait a minute. Before you flip the play, page, go back to verse 11. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and who, who sat on the horse was faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire. His head are many diadems, and he has a name written on it which no one knows except he himself. He is clothed with a blood, robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed in linen, white clothes, were following him. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, that with it he's to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his side, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of of lords. That, that's that Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's that same Jesus who said it is finished and shed the one perfect human life that ever was for your sins and my sins. Amen? Amen. That's that one Jesus. Not on a donkey again, Zechariah 9.9. You know, but on the with the armies of heaven on a stallion coming, that's our Jesus. And we know from Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and though this sat of them, and judgment was given to them, and the souls of those who were beheaded, there's the beheaded again, Kathy, because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or the image and not received the mark on the head and on the hand, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Wow. You know, a lot of people speculate on this amillennial position. They say, well, maybe there's not a millennium. You know, if the Bible says something six times, wouldn't you have to think about it a few times? Like Wally had one thought every now and then. You'd have to have six thoughts on this, on <laughs> Wally. Yeah, why would you want to throw away the notion of a millennium? You know, as Anthony says, classical premillennial. Jesus is coming before. He's going to start transitioning. What we've taken 7,000 years or more to mess up. What we have messed up. He's going to transition to wolf lying with the lamb. You know, child playing with snakes and all that stuff. And bringing peace again to the earth where we have had nothing but war. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and the spears and the pruning hooks. You have to have a transition time. And that is clear and simple, the millennium. We don't need to miss that. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one. Oh, I've got to read verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over those, the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him a thousand years. Folks, you are training for reigning and you are schooling for ruling. That's what I tell them in Georgia. That works good in Georgia. I don't know if it works in Arkansas. No, I think <laughs> they're training for you are training for reigning and you're being schooled to rule. Be thou ruler over ten cities, be thou ruler over five cities, be thou ruler over pumpkin center, whatever it is. You have a place of authority. Kings and priests. You know what peace Priests do, they mediate between the common people, and that's the nations and everyone else who are, is mortal during that period of time. You will be immoral, incorruptible, 
never dying, and you will mediate between the common people and Jesus himself and God himself. Wow, isn't that cool? And now you get to Revelation 21. Um, this, is, this is like, I don't want to be derogatory. This is the big G coming on down. This is the summation of Genesis 3, 8 coming back. You know, restoration of all things. Our daddy, Abba Father, was with us in the garden. Remember that verse in Genesis 3, 8 we read this morning? They heard the voice or the sound, Nancy, of the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening breeze. Wow. Yeah, I love to go out on those, those nights in Georgia, uh, down in Pumpkin Center too, where the cicadas are coming out and it's kind of cool out and they crawl up in the oak trees and all the... It's just, wow, that's cool. And I can just imagine the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening breeze in his creation in the beginning. Guess what? Guess what? One through four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready for a husband and a bride adorned for a husband. By the way, this answers the Lord's prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is it, folks. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with us. Wow. Can I get an amen? amen. I'll amen myself if I have to. <laughs> Joe, my, we heard that some black preacher in Atlanta said, I'll just amen myself then. God Himself will be among them. God Himself will be among us again. We saints, as Sir Anthony has beautifully pointed, we saints who will rule and reign with Christ eventually will be transitioned through the rule of Jesus and we, God Himself, will be able to be among us again. Isn't that cool? Wow. For He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. For the former things have passed away. Verse 5, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Doesn't get any better than that. Leroy Shaw, <laughs> looking at Miss Jerry, I'm going to cry almost, but Leroy Shaw and I walked up that 11,000 Pagosa Peak a couple times. Man, Leroy, he would just walk up that thing like there's nothing there. And I, I've been sitting at a desk all year, and I'm like, ee, 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 I don't know if I can make it top, Leroy. But the top of Pagosa Peak, man, the top has snow, and you look over those Colorado mountains, and you, oh, man, it doesn't get any better than that. And God Himself will be with His creation again. Hallelujah. And we will dwell with Him forever and ever and ever. And please note that He makes all things new. He doesn't make all new things. That's why we have a new heaven and a new earth. In a little discussion this morning, we, we kind of noted that Second Peter. I was doing something... Tom and I used to be crazy. You know what, Tom? We used to be crazy in these Arkansas camps. I swung off the rafters a couple of times. I don't know. I just wanted to shake those kids up, whatever, whatever we had to do. And somebody remembered that on Facebook, and, and they remind me, Brother Joe, you know it's all going to burn. Because <laughs> back in the day, whenever it was, Tom had his 12 string and we were picking and grinning and I preached a sermon on 
It's all going to burn. Don't, don't worry about that house. Don't worry about that car. Don't worry about that boat. Don't worry about them dresses, lady. Don't, ladies, don't worry about them shoes. It's all going to burn. Yes. Second Peter says the elements will melt with fervent heat. Went up to see Bill Wachtell, mentioning Bill uh, one day, and they had a, he and Phyllis had a ranch outside, and they had some old cars. And when I visited, one of those firestorms had rolled through the ranch. And I went out to look at the old cars. And, and the headlights, if they were glass, they melted. It looked like teardrops. The elements how melted with fervent heat. And anything that wasn't absolute steel, the aluminum, it, of course, the total inside of the car was totally wiped out. It melted into the ground, I'm telling you. And God takes those elements and reforms them and makes a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? He makes all things new. Wow. It doesn't get much better than that. And then go to Revelation 22. Wow. Oh, let me read 21, 22. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are His temple. By the way, now let me just remind you of this. You've got great theology and great Christology with the one true God. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Hod. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is the ultimate uh, creed of Christianity too because in Mark 12, 29, Jesus said exactly the same thing again. The Lord God Almighty. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ehad, one. And Jesus repeats that. And the term Almighty is never used of Jesus. Did you notice that? I have in my Bible on the bottom of that, that page right there, I have all the times Almighty is used. And it's never used of Jesus. He's Son of the Most High, Son of the Almighty, but He's not the Almighty. That's the Lord God Almighty. But also the Lamb is critical too, is going to be His, the light of the, the, the eternity, if you will. The light of eternity. 22, 3, and 4. 4 might be the best verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God, Genesis 1, 1. God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. What's the third, first thing that Adam saw then? God. His face. Now, I don't know what your anthropological considerations of the form of God is, but I think when God enters our space and time, He has a form. In fact, we're in the image of God. It says the angels in me, God. So some type of form, I don't know. And I do believe God hides a face because in Exodus 33, Moses says, I want to see you. Remember that, Lottie? I want to see you, but you can't see me, Jason. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, Moses, and I'll pass by and you'll see my glory. Because nobody can look on my face in your stinking sinless condition and live. That was a pumpkin center ad lib on that stinking <laughs> sin. <laughs> you can't look on my face and live. So I say, I'm, I'm thinking God has a face. What do you think about that, Bill? And so if the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his face. Oh, Adam comes alive and hears the face of God two feet away. But after the sin, no more. Out of the garden. Revelation 22, 3 and 4. There will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His bondservants will serve Him, and they will see His face again. Humanity will be able to look on Abba, Father. You know, Jesus prayed in the garden, garden, Abba, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. And so we need to think of God as our true and ultimate dad who's tried to get us closer and closer. To, and we're ministers of reconciliation to bring us back closer and closer to God. And so eventually we, saints of Jesus Christ, can see Daddy again. What about that, Sister Melissa? That's pretty good stuff. 
I long to see my daddy one day, or pretty soon, you know. But the ultimate seeing that I will see, Brother Dan, is my father who is in heaven right now because he is literally going to be able to come back to his creation and walk in the cool of the evening breeze. I get shivers just thinking about that, closing my eyes. Wow. And we, so we have these admonitions, as someone else said in 22, don't add to it, don't take away, you know. The last verse in the Bible says, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all, you know. Uh, Sir Anthony has beautifully pointed out, I think you mentioned this, Anthony, in, in Acts 20, 24, and 25, Acts 20, 24, and 25. The gospel of grace is the gospel of the kingdom. Acts 20, 24, and 25. Paul is talking about, I finished my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testifying solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I, the, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. The gospel of grace is the gospel of the kingdom. And the last word in the Bible, it says again, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. We have a blessed, blessed, blessed hope. First of all, we have that, what, what do we call it this afternoon? That first stage of the kingdom, the millennium. That's, a, that's just the first stage that's just the beginning of the ultimate end. And the ultimate end is not the ultimate end. It's the ultimate beginning when you'll be able to live in holiness with the Lord your God who created you, who knit that DNA in your mama's womb. He knew you from the foundation of the earth, Ephesians 1 said, and He will give you the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Amen? Amen. This is so beautiful. Our what do you call it? Eschatology. Our notions of Jesus coming back are nothing but straight Bible, y'all. This is nothing but straight Bible. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with the shout and the voice. We don't care what the naysayers say. Oh, where's the promise of it coming? We've heard this stuff. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is not willing that any should perish. He wants us to get more people close to Him, and that's our job. Matthew 24, 14. To preach the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth, and then the end can come. Then Jesus comes back. But we still, as long as we have breath, we're sucking air, we're on the right side of the grave, we better be preaching about Jesus and the coming kingdom. Amen? The beauty of Revelation 21 and 22 is phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. No more crying. No more mourning, no more pain, the former things have passed away. He's making all new things. And there will be no longer any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His bond servants will serve, will serve Him, and they will see His face. That is your hope. That is your ultimate end, but no, that is your ultimate beginning so whatever you do, as you go out from this place, as we go back to the McGinney Town Church tomorrow, as I go back to Atlanta, and Je Jerry goes back to Oklahoma, or you go back wherever you are, Bob goes back to Louisiana, bless his heart. <laughs> we still have a job to do, and that is to preach the gospel, the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ and the kingdom for our eternal salvation in the eternal kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you.